So let's look at our first section in polynomials. And in this section, what we're going to do is we're going to define and recognize properties of a polynomial function and also determine the real zeros of that polynomial function. But before we get into it, let's look at our definition of what a polynomial is. And here's a polynomial expression. And this polynomial expression is in the form a x to the n, b n minus 1, etc., where the a value is not equal to 0. Things we have to keep in mind about a polynomial. The exponents must be whole numbers. So this n value must be a whole number, whether it's 7, 6, 5, etc. The coefficients, the numbers in front, must be real numbers. And thankfully, we're just going to deal with real numbers when we deal with polynomials. And a polynomial is defined by its n value and its leading coefficient a. And the n and the a is the start of the polynomial function. And it's that beginning piece of the polynomial function or polynomial expression that's going to define it and give us some information. Now, what does that mean? Here are some polynomials. Let's first look at their degree. And the degree is defined by the leading exponent. So the first one is a polynomial of degree 4. The a value, the number in front of that highest exponent, is the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient would be 5. And this polynomial is degree 4. And we would just either call it a polynomial or, because it has three terms, a trinomial. Just three numbers there, three values, we call it a trinomial. Because the degree is greater than 4, we would call it just a polynomial. Well, let's look at the degree on the remaining ones. Working our way down, we see we have a 3. It is degree 3. Highest exponent on h of x is degree 2. Highest exponent on p of x, now we have to be careful here, remember there's an imaginary 1 on this x, is degree 1. And when we have this d of x, though no x is there, keep in mind we could write this as x to the 0. Remember, x to the 0 is the same as 1, that's degree 0. So when we look at the degree, the number in front of that variable with that degree is the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient on g of x is root 5. Leading coefficient on h of x is negative 3. p of x, be careful with this one, it's 4. And the leading coefficient on d of x would be negative 3. And these polynomials we've seen before, you probably already know the names. Now, technically, they are all polynomials. But when we go degree 3 or less, we have special names. Degree 3 is a cubic polynomial. And again, we might also call this a trinomial because it has three terms. The next one, degree 2, well, you did this a lot last year. This is a quadratic. And again, it's got two terms, so we sometimes call it a binomial. Next one down, well, this is just degree 1. That is our linear and again, we'd probably consider this a binomial because it's two terms. And when we have a single term with no degree, we have a constant. And if it's a single term, we would consider it a monomial. So different words to describe each of those polynomial functions. The important thing to recognize is the degree and the leading coefficient play a big role. Now, a polynomial function, if we were to graph it, what makes it polynomial is there are no breaks or sharp corners. So when we look at polynomials we already know, here is a linear graph, a straight line. If we were to sketch in that line, we would have no lifting of our pencil. It's continuous, no breaks or corners. Same for this parabola, quadratic function, no breaks or corners. 
Here is a cubic function. And a cubic function, again, no breaks or corners. Now, a cubic function could also look, if we were graphing a cubic function, it may not have the turns. It may just look like so. And we're going to look at that in more detail in this lesson. But there is a basic cubic function with no turns. But this last one definitely requires a lifting of the pencil when you sketch it. There's our lift, which means it's not a continuous function, which means it is not a polynomial. And that's going to become important, especially when you go on and do calculus, whether it's continuous or not. Well, another piece of polynomial functions that we're going to concern ourselves with is the end behavior. And the end behavior is really determined by the leading coefficient. And when we say end behavior, what we're talking about is the direction the arrows will point on the polynomial function. So let's look at this with ones we already know. Start with the first one, our quadratic function. Now there's the quadratic, and remember from our transformations unit, we see that the negative just reflects it across the x-axis. If we were looking at our end behavior, what we're looking at then is what happens here at the end of the graph. And we can see in this quadratic function, the left side of our graph is going to point up, and so is the right side. We've already done domain and range for quadratics. The domain here, all real numbers, and the range, all real numbers. And now if we compare that to n, the n in this case is our degree, which is 2, and our a value, the number in front, is 1, which we're really going to consider is greater than 0. 1 is positive or greater than 0, and we're going to see that come into play in more detail. The same can be said for the next function. The only difference now, our n behavior, instead of being up, they're both down. The left side is down, and the right side is down. The domain doesn't change. The range doesn't change. The degree doesn't change. Our a value, though, now is negative 1. And we probably can see a pattern. Negative 1 is less than 0. The only thing that changes is the a value. And that causes our polynomial, our quadratic, to change its end behavior. Well, let's sketch in the cubic function. And a basic cubic function, if we put zeros in there, we're going to be at 0, 0. If we put 1 in for x, we're going to be at 1, 1. If we put 2 in for x, we'll be at 2, 8, which is going to go off the page. We could put the negatives in, and you can see, just with some basic calculations, we'll get a graph that looks like so. Now, if we have a negative x, it reflects across the y-axis, and we get a graph that looks like so. And based on those two pictures, see if you can pause it right now and determine the end behavior, domain range, n and a. So there is the information for y equals x cubed, the left is down, the right is up, and all our information. And there is if we reflect it across the y-axis, where we now have left up and right down, nothing else changes. And from this, we can see that what changes the end behavior is the value of a. The value of a is what determines the end behavior. If we were to extend this for higher degree polynomials, the pattern would hold true. Whether we have degree 2, degree 3, degree 4, degree 5, the pattern holds true. The end behavior for an even degree polynomial is this pattern. If a is greater than 0, we're going to have a left up, right up. If the a is less than 0, we're going to have left down and right down. 
if we have an odd degree polynomial, an odd degree, this same pattern holds true. Odd degree polynomial, 3, 5, 7, 9. If A is greater than 0, we have left down, right up. And if A is less than 0, we have left up, right down. Now, the N, the degree, tells you the basic shape. And the A will tell you the direction of the end behaviors. And we're going to extend this for higher order polynomials in class. But that's the important piece. A gives us the direction of the end behaviors. N gives us the shape. Now, when we have this shape, any of the middle terms in a polynomial are going to determine how many turns that polynomial function has. If we go back to our page in our notes and look at this cubic function, it's all of these middle terms that will determine how the graph looks. Whether we have the basic shape in green or we have the red shape of these turns. And it's those middle terms that come into play that help us determine what the turning points are. The turning points, though, have a certain maximum. And the maximum number of turning points is related to the degree. And the maximum number of turning points is always n minus 1, but we might have fewer. Now, what does that mean? If our degree was 4, that tells us that our turning points are, at maximum, 3 turning points. And we're going to put this all together when we start sketching graphs, but we know a degree 4 polynomial has only, at maximum, 3 turning points. So let's look at an example here where we put it all together. And the important piece for this example is we want to look at the A value and the degree of this polynomial. Well, first of all, we can see that it is degree 5 polynomial. That's the highest exponent. The A value in this case, now A is equal to negative 5. But remember, we're just concerned that A is negative. That's going to help us determine the end behavior. And if we're looking for the turning points, remember the turning points is always n minus 1 for maximum. In this case, it'll be 5 minus 1. So right away, we know 4. So we know the degree already, degree 5. The turning points is 4. What we want to do is consider a less than 0 for an odd degree polynomial. Odd degree polynomial. Now, if you think about the basic graph of an odd degree polynomial, think of a cubic. It can generalize for anything. Go look back in your notes if you need to. Odd degree polynomial with a negative. There's our picture. We can generalize this for every odd degree polynomial. And we would say the left is up and the right is down. And we're going to do this a lot more. That's just one thing we have to remember. Negative a odd degree polynomial, left arm up, right arm down in our polynomial function. Well, let's keep going with polynomial functions because when we sketch and start to graph polynomial functions, we're going to need to find zeros of these functions. And the zeros on a polynomial function is where it crosses the x-axis. They're also called things like roots, solutions, x-intercepts. The important thing here is we must factor a polynomial. We are going to bring all of our rules of factoring back into play. And technically, the zeros can be real or imaginary. The good part about this course is we're only going to deal with real zeros in PC12. Other courses will deal with the imaginary zeros. So let's put this into play with this equation. Find the real zeros of f of x equals x to the fifth minus 16x. And the important thing here is we must factor this first. So f of x, if we were to factor it, there's a common factor of x. 
leaving us with x to the 4 minus 16. Keep in mind, we always have to look, is it fully factored? Clearly not, because we have a difference of squares. This factors into x squared minus 4, x squared plus 4, and we're still not quite done. We still have one difference of squares. We have an x plus 2, x minus 2, and then we drag down that x squared plus 4. So to determine the zeros, we have to find out what value for x, when we put it in the function, would make each of these factors zero. So let's start with the first one. What value for x would make that zero? Well, it's pretty obvious. If we put zero in for x, zero multiplied by anything will be zero. What about here? Well, inside that bracket, if we were to put a negative two, we would get a zero. What about the next one? Well, if we put a plus two, we would get a zero. And the last one, the last one's a little bit tricky here. If we're not sure, we can always just take the equation inside the bracket, set it equal to zero, and solve it. And for this one, we can see we can't take the square root of a negative number so this fraction, the last one, would actually contribute no zeros. So if we're looking for the zeros, it's just the solutions. x equals 0, x equals plus 2, and minus 2. And often we would write this as just x equals 0 and plus and minus 2. There's how we'd normally write the solution. Now another thing to keep in mind about polynomials we're going to look at this again as we do more polynomials. The degree of the function is n. That means the polynomial must have at most n real zeros. If we were to apply this to our example, our n in this case is 5. So we can have at most 5 zeros. We don't have to have five zeros, but at most we can have five zeros. If we look down here, we actually only have three zeros, but we could have at most five. That's where n becomes important, determining the number of zeros. And we're going to look at this in more detail as we go deeper into polynomials in class.